Hello and welcome to the Andwise podcast. We are delighted to have you here spending some time with us. Andwise is a technology platform that aims to empower medical students, trainees and early career physicians to navigate the complex financial journey that we all find ourselves on as we aim to help others. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Hello and welcome to the Andwise podcast. I'm so delighted today to be joined by one of my old med school classmates, Dr. Ricky Rosella. He is a neurologist. He went to Princeton for undergrad. He went to Robert Johnson Medical School. He did his neurology training at New York University, where I did my internal medicine training. And he's just one of the most honest, down-to-earth and nurturing people I know. He's so generous with his time. He's one of our medical advisory board members at NYS, and he's just so open about his own financial journey. Ricky, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Varun. And uh, yeah, everybody, I, I pay for Varun to like me and say those good words. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let Ricky uh, tell his own story um, about his own financial journey a little later, but I thought we would do things a little bit differently and start with rapid fire question and answer. I didn't give Ricky these questions ahead awesome. of time. So Ricky, I'm basing these questions based on recurring posts I see again and again on physician Facebook mm. discussion boards, Reddit, all that jazz. Question number one, you ready? Oh my God, should I stretch first? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, ready. Ricky, do you have any opinion on how much physicians need to retire? And you don't need to throw out a dollar amount, but do you ever use any rule of thumb like 20X your salary, 25X your salary? Do you have any of those rules of thumbs or not really? The reason I ask these questions is because in my own life, it's like the goalposts keep moving. And I'm in my 40s now, but I look at physicians in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and I'm sometimes like, why are these girls and guys working so hard and killing themselves? Do they have that number in mind? Do you think that there's something in your experience that you've heard? Should it be 20x your salary, 25x your salary? What's the number we should aim for? First of all, man, you don't look like you're your 40s, dude. You look just like you're your 20s, just when I first met you in med school. But um, yeah, I myself like using the 4% rule um, that's based on uh, research by Bill Began, old school financial advisor who I think he majored in astrophysics or something like or he was some, a mechanical and aerospace engineer. But anyway, he mathed the crap out of what you should aim for when you're spending in retirement. And he came up with, hey, if you spend 4% inflation adjusted of, of your nest egg, you are almost guaranteed 100%, depending on your asset allocation, to never run out of money in retirement. So that's a nice guideline. It was never designed as a hard sort of law in order to have retirement success, but it has shown mathematically and with research that should be a really good starting point. It was then verified a few years later in Trinity University. I think it's a college in Texas, but some financial economic researchers sort of verify the 4% rule would be safe. So I usually start there. That's actually a withdrawal. If you just 25X what your basic spend is, that would be the, the number. Usually I use the 4% rule and most people who are serious about really planning for retirement, that is the uh, rule, 4% of your nest egg, which algebraically means that it's 25x of whatever you spend a year. I spend a lot of money and um, <laughs> projected to spend a lot of money in retirement. I will throw a number out there. It's probably going to be 160k a year. Me and Meredith, my wife, are going to spend towards retirement. My number is going to be $4 million of investable assets. Again, me and Meredith are not the most frugal docs in the world. And yeah, I, in New I, Jersey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, so that makes it, yeah. Exactly. You're absolutely right. It all depends on everyone's individual life circumstance. New Jersey is a very high cost of living state. I live here too. We're at opposite ends of the state. I'm near Philly. You're near New York and property taxes are very high. Everyone's life situation is going to be different, but I love that you brought up the 4% rule for the beginners and those that might be driving real quick. What Ricky said was that's a withdrawal rate. I'm just making up numbers, but if you're shooting for a million dollars times by 0 0.04, then you can only withdraw $40,000 a year. 
And what, what Ricky did is he worked backwards. He says the day he retires and him and his physician wife retire, they want to be able to live off $160,000 a year. So he took 160, he divided it by 0 0.04 and that's where he came up with a 4 million number. So that's, that's what you were saying, Ricky. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Again, everyone's circumstance is completely different. If you're Miss, Mr. Money Mustache and go and, can go and live in the woods with riding your bike everywhere and in a low cost of living area, you might be able to get oh by God. with 40 grand a year. So, all right. Second, oh, my God. I think he does less. <laughs> yeah. Um, 40 grand. Second, I think like four grand a year or something. Though. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Second, second question for you, Ricky. This is based mm -hmm. off of the fact that many physicians I find are stuck in the weeds and focusing on things that aren't going to really turn the needle. I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I got obsessed with trying to get credit card bonuses. The sign-up bonuses you get mm -hmm. like 50,000 points, 100,000 points. But then you're stuck with these cards with annual fees and stuff. I was just going over my credit cards the other day and I was like, why do I have so many cards open? Like for what? I'm chasing like a 0.5% um, bonus category. The cards I use now are just a straight 2% cashback card. Actually, it's a 2.5% cashback card. It's an Alliant Credit Union credit card. So I get straight 2.5% cashback. Mm year on every single dollar I spend. Then I signed up for the Amazon Chase card. I get 5% cash back on purchases made at mm -hmm. Amazon. Other than that, all of my other cards I look at and I'm like, this is a waste of money trying to chase 3% versus 2.5%. If you do the math, if you spend $1,000 on groceries every month and times by 12, and we have a family of five times by 12, and then times that by 0 0.005, the extra 0.5% is $60 a year. I think for most physicians, like trying to make it ultra complicated is a total waste of time. But that's just my personal opinion. I guess some people might be better than it than me. So I try to keep it simple. I have two or three credit cards, Max. Do you have a favorite credit card? I threw out two there, the Alliant Credit Union Visa <laughs> card and the yeah. Amazon Chase card. What do you and yeah. you? If you're comfortable sharing. Oh uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. When it comes to credit rewards points or credit card hacking, whether it's cash back or travel rewards, you're violating sort of what Ramit Sethi, very well known financial uh, blogger, podcast personality, he says, don't ask hundred dollar questions. Ask and focus on thousand dollar questions. But the credit rewards is more like almost pennies, not even hundred dollar questions. That being said, I am obsessed just like you with the uh, uh, credit card rewards uh, hacking. And my personal favorite is the Fidelity Visa. And what happens, you get 2% cash back on anything that you purchase. That 2% you can actually put in your Fidelity investment account, taxable account. But not only is that a great reward for anything that you buy, and like I said, I spend a lot of money, me and Meredith. So it's almost like you get a 2% discount on everything that you buy. But then that cash back is mentally and psychologically focused into investing, right? Whereas a lot of people, I think, that have cash back, they may just use it to maybe help pay down their credit card statement. Or whereas the cash back is mentally almost accounted because it's tied to my Fidelity account. And we just invest that cash back. So that's why I like it, not only because of the 2% cash back on everything, but also the sort of mental accounting where I will invest that cash back into my taxable. I do have multiple credit cards. I think we had 20 at last count. We've made, me and Meredith, we're each other's authorized users. So half of those cards are in my name, the other half are in Meredith's name. When you're authorized users on each, they can boost your credit score of each other. I have done the credit card hacking to not only increase cash back, but also to boost credit score. And those other credit cards, they either offered 5% cash back on rotating categories, as well as when you open them, if you spend like $1,000 or $2,000, you get $100 cash back, $200 cash back, like a promotion to get you to sign up. I definitely took advantage of those. And so back to your point, you're definitely right. It's a hundred dollar question, not the thousand dollar questions that you should really focus on in terms yeah. of personal. Yeah, and it, it's funny. I probably have eighteen or twenty as well. I'm going to hold up to the Amex Platinum and the Chase Sapphire Reserve. These, because now with three yeah. young kids, we don't travel that much. These are actually like very useless cards for me personally to hold because the Amex Platinum, the gold card, is much better. It pays you for food and 
groceries. The platinum card only pays for travel, like the bonus 10x category. So people, I think you're right, got to start thinking about $1,000 questions. I think a 2% straight ca cashback card is great. I have the Alliant card. If you want to squeeze out a little more juice, 2.5%. <laughs> you, yeah. you have to park $1,000 with their credit union. So there's like the opportunity cost of that but it's not too heavy of a lift. All right, next question for you, since I see a billion doctors asking this all the time. Sandy and I, my wife used to bank at mm -hmm. a brick and mortar bank, TD Bank, and you know, just like Bank of America, Chase, mm -hmm. all of these banks for the money they hold pay pittance. They pay like 0.05% interest rate. Do you have any high yield savings mm -hmm. account or anything that you and Mayor use? I'll give you my example. We use Wealthfront and it pays around 5% for our cash lying around. Now, the only downside mm -hmm. is that you have to plan every month to automatically transfer money from the Wealthfront account into your day-to-day -day checking account, or you might overdraft. <laughs> Other than that, I've seen a lot of doctors using American Express high-yield savings accounts, using Ally, using mm -hmm. SoFi. Do you have any account like that you like personally that you've used? Absolutely. I was chasing yield when yields were really tiny just because it was so easy. The uh, last high yield online savings account that I had was SoFi. And this was when, oh my God, it's offering 1% before inflation had skyrocketed and interest rates with it. That was my favorite. But now with rates being like so much higher, it doesn't seem like the extra squeeze is, is worth it. I've actually taken all our high yield savings uh, out of the uh, online space because now we use a brick and mortar bank, PNC, and I get 4.3% uh, on my savings, the high yield savings. I do have actually the PNC cash rewards card, like going back to the cash rewards. When you have that cash rewards card, you can actually get a higher rate for your high yield savings at, at, the, at PNC. But even though PNC is a brick and mortar, it does have a savings account that uh, matches uh, a lot of the high yield save savings. Also, I'm putting a pool in the backyard too, which just skyrockets in cost. It's now teetering on a little less than half a million, like 400K, dude, for, for a freaking pool. Most of it's landscaping. Anyway, it really helps to have the brick and mortar because you can write the checks quickly. The brick and mortar place, if I need cash, because sometimes some of the work, if you pay cash, they'll give you a discount. It, just for my needs right now, it helps to have that brick and mortar and at PNC, at least, I, I got to deal with the high yield is really high yield and comparable to the online, non brick and mortar high yield banks. That's awesome. Next question, and then we'll go into the more traditional format. You've been attending for about 10 years now. When you're in the hospital or clinic or whatever, I find that financial wellness and money and stuff is still such a taboo subject. Even people I'm friends with, don't really discuss like best practices or, hey, like I did this. People just scurry off and spend time with your family or their personal lives. What is your experience? Mm -hmm. And do you think that physicians, trainees, medical students are getting better? Because even with the best mentors in the world, I found like I was very, and they were very focused on just the medical training aspect and not personal life and optimizing your personal lives and stuff. No one ever talked about that stuff. Like what happens once you leave the hospital? Have you received good guidance or no guidance from people around you in the healthcare setting? What do you think? Fortunately, no guidance. And that's what led me to make a lot of financial mistakes and lose 50K to whole life insurance. And, you know, mistaking Northwestern Mutual financial advisors as advisors. They're really salesmen. And Unfortunately, it's not illegal to misguide doctors into bad financial decisions or basically screwing people out of money. There's no law against it. Whole life insurance is totally legal. I think the problem is that because it's not illegal to be screwed by the financial services industry, that's why doctors are taking advantage of like me and then now I lose money. As doctors, it is such a taboo structure, subject to not talk about money. The only way you think that a financial advisor will be bad or will be bleeding you out of money, I was thinking, oh, it's not illegal, so they can't really be screwing me. Mark. I think because we have a trust that the law will protect us from being screwed, even though it's obvious there's no law against screwing people in this country. You car salesmen do it all the time, right? So do financial quote unquote advisors. I think that inhibits doctors from saying, oh, I need to talk to other people about my finances. 
to to protect myself. I think that's one. You have this sort of simplistic idea that, oh, if it's not illegal, they're not going to screw me. Otherwise, they go to jail. So that's one. Number two is that already as doctors, you're expected to be rich, right? By virtue of just having an MD and being an attending. I, uh, it, I'm being facetious, but then not really. I, I'll just rub up my, my MD diploma against an ATM and just it starts spouting off uh, cash, like thousands of dollars, just as long as I'm treating patients and doing good in the world. And uh, so I think that also inhibits doctors from talking about their their financial lives is because you assume you don't need to talk about it because every doctor is rich, right? And finally, number three, and this was definitely a big one for me, uh, learning about finances or budgeting, it takes time. I want to dedicate as much energy as possible to my patients. And in order to get into medical school and become a doctor, I had to give up a lot of my personal life, a lot of my personal time. That also includes time to learn finance. And you think that, oh, if I spend more time reading about personal finance, I'm taking away time away from my patients and learning my craft, you know, like neurology. I'm a neurologist. I never thought that being financially illiterate would cause me to be a crappy doctor. And I remember writing about this for Andwise, right? That because I was in financial devastation, first of all, I didn't expect it, right? I'm a doctor, right? I'm supposed to be rich. Hell, I'm married to an anesthesiologist. Why are we in $31,000 in credit card debt? I was actually trying to go through patients as fast as possible, trying to make more money to keep up with the $28,000 of whole life insurance premiums and still being in $31,000 of credit card debt because my financial court court advisor said whole life insurance is the best thing since sliced bread and I'll accomplish all my financial goals. I think those three reasons are, are big and really I'm trying to break that. I'm the one now at my practice. I'm telling everybody like, hey, don't buy whole life insurance. It's legalized stealing. Oh, are you budgeting? Are you saving 20% to your retirement? Are you maximizing your retirement accounts? Are you doing the backdoor Roth? I think as I talk about it more, it'll just spread. That's why I like what we're doing here at Anwise with you, just spreading you are the word. The, the more voices, the better. You are definitely the evangelist for not getting whole life insurance. I love it. I love the fact that you share your story so openly. It's great. It's fantastic. Oh, my God. I can't scream it loud enough because I still continually meet people that have a whole life policy. They're still being sold to. Even when I got financially lured, my... Uh, the, one of the girls I practiced with, she bought a whole life policy. She had bought it years ago, but I was, oh my God, this is so pervasive and nobody talks about it and we really should. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you're so willing to share your story. Thank you. You did a lot of self-directed learning using some of the existing financial bloggers that are out there. I know you took a mm -hmm. course about making mm -hmm. a financial plan and stuff. Have you or you and your wife ever had a paid financial advisor? Because one of the things that I see in the physician community are that there's a lot of trepidation and suspicion because a lot of them charge like 1%. Actually, I, I have a physician buddy that's family's probably worth like nine figures and he just pays Goldman Sachs like 2% AUM a year, which is going to add up to millions of dollars over the course of their lifetime. He just doesn't care because he doesn't have the bandwidth to think about this stuff. But a lot of the physician community seems to be split in three camps. Pay other people, which is fine. As long as you're cognizant about the fees, I think you can find a fixed fee only advisor. There's the camp that Bogleheads, White Cut Investor does it themselves, either picks Fidelity or Vanguard and does it themselves. And then unfortunately, there's a third camp that's stuck in indecision fatigue and they do nothing. And it's sad. They only contribute like to their employer sponsored retirement accounts. And meanwhile, they're not doing much. It sounds like you did a lot of self-directed stuff, right? Or did you ever have a financial advisor? Actually, the Northwestern Mutual basically lies and say, says, I use the financial quote-unquote advisor when they work for Northwestern Mutual or any insurance company. Insurance companies are incentivized to sell products. Even though my buddy he at Northwestern Mutual was a CFP, by virtue of him making commission by working for an insurance company, he's automatically incentivized. It's very hard. You can be the most moral guy in the world, but when your your paycheck depends on you selling and screwing people by selling as many whole life policies as possible, there's a conflict of interest there. The CFP designation does not like an MD. He's still a CFP. He still works at Northwestern Mutual. There's no punitive damage for making me lose fifty thousand 
because of that, I never got another quote unquote financial advisor because it's very difficult to decide uh, who is trustworthy and not. You can't even use the letters at the end of the financial quote unquote advisor's names. Supposedly the CFE, the certified financial planner, you're taught to be a fiduciary, meaning you do the most optimized thing for your client, not the most optimized salary for you as an advisor. And my buddy had violated that because he works for Northwestern Mutual. He works for an insurance company. It, it, it could have been the same if you work for State Farm or Guardian or whatever. They, if you work for an insurance company, it's very hard for you to be a fiduciary financial advisor, but it's not illegal for you to say you have a CFE. Yeah. I think a lot of people who like doctors who don't want to get into this stuff should have, have a financial advisor here at NY. You will have vetted. Tanya, absolutely trustworthy, right? She felt so bad for me with uh, being screwed with whole life insurance. And I learned a lot of this stuff from the white coat investor, but they also have vetted certified financial planners as well and financial advisors. I think the majority of physicians, I was one of them. I just wanted Northwestern Mutual to take care of me. I just wanted to focus on my patients, man. I didn't know mistaking a financial advisor and, and, and mistaking him uh, for an advisor when he was really a salesman. I never thought it would screw me or make me a sh like a crappier doctor. I was about to freaking curse, man. I, I really just wanted somebody to take care of me and I could just focus on my patients. And then when I retire, I'll have the most money possible. Uh, I only DIY it now because of my experience with a bad quote unquote financial CFP advisor. And I never wanted to do a DIY it. But now I was, I was so pissed off by being screwed by Western Mutual that now I DIY it. The only reason I try to talk about it and, and here at NYS being part of the medical advisory board, we're doctors, man. We don't deserve these rules. We're doing God's work, man. We're saving lives. We're helping people and their families. Northwestern Mutual should not be allowed to do this to us or, or the financial industry. But unfortunately, it's not illegal. And the only way to protect ourselves is really to spread the word. And we refer to uh, vetted financial advisors as yeah. well as uh, for myself. I feel more comfortable DIYing. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Finding that connection that has some sort of credentials, that's low fee. Even then, though, you really have to be involved because no one's going to care about your money as much as you care about your money. I, I have an elderly family member that went with Vanguard Personal Advisory Services, very low cost, 0.3%, but their financial advisor changed four times over the course of two or three years, and their risk allocation really wasn't appropriate for their age and their income. Also, somehow... In the course of multiple meetings with their financial advisor, they left out the fact that they had multiple six figures lying around in cash. It really wasn't invested. They missed all of these upsides in the market and stuff. My point is, even when you get a financial advisor, it's like sort of garbage in, garbage out. Unless you are willing to be completely honest and transparent with this person and to talk to them about your goals and your assets and your your expenditures, you're, you're going to get garbage information out. It's like when people go to the doctor and lie. You might get the wrong diagnosis. You might <laughs> prescribe the wrong drugs. Yeah, no one's going to care as much about your money as you do. Even if you decide mm -hmm. to go with someone, it helps to have a baseline level of a little bit of education. So that's great. Absolutely. Let me bring up a controversial topic because we both went to quite expensive private undergrads. I went to New York University undergrad when I was a new immigrant mm -hmm. from Australia. And my dad and my mm -hmm. mom helped me out a lot and paid for the tuition, which back in the day was $22,000 a year. I just looked it up the other day. Mm -hmm. NYU tuition now, as of today, is 65000 just for commuters. And I commuted. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. So I, the only debt I have is one hundred and sixty k from medical school only, quite unquote. But I see a lot of younger mm -hmm. kids yeah. coming out with much more double mm -hmm. now. But anyway, my question is, you went to mm -hmm. Princeton. I went to NYU. Do you think for mm -hmm. anyone that wants to become a physician right now as of 2023, do you think it makes any difference where they go to undergrad? I'm throwing fuel on the fire here because we, we have a buddy that's a vascular surgeon mm -hmm. that went to mm -hmm. Cornell and he <laughs> loves the yeah. fact that he went to Cornell. I mean, he talks about it all the time. He yeah. thinks that yeah. it made a huge difference to his career trajectory. But then when he got to Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson, like all of us, I remember one of the Rutgers mm -hmm. kids being like, we're all here. Yeah. Do you think mm -hmm. your own children, do you think if they want to be physicians, do you think it's going to matter if they go to a very expensive undergrad university or if they go to state school? I think it does. And I can't really quantify or really say how expensive or how highly rated 
uh, a school has to be in order to make a difference. All I know is, man, I went to Princeton and it was oscillating between number one, and it still does between Harvard. I interviewed at Robert Wood the next day I got in. It was probably only because I went to Princeton. My GPA at Princeton was average, like 3.3. MCAT was like a 35. I, I don't think the scale of, of that works anymore, but it was a pretty good MCAT score. But above 30, uh, like at our time, was competitive, right? I really just got in because of the name. And dude, like when we went to Robert Wood, all those Rutgers guys, that they're smarter than me. They are. You know, Neeraj, Neeraj, like he was like, for every one of me, there's 10 other guys who had the same MCAT scores, 4.0 GPAs at Rutgers, who didn't get into Robert Wood. They can't take everybody from Rutgers, right? Me having the name of Princeton really helped. Neeraj didn't get in right after. And he's super smart, man. He's like a freaking cardiologist in Cali. He's a very, very good doctor, very competitive specialty he got into. He had to wait. He had a better GPA than I did. He had better MCAT scores than I did. He had to wait to get in after his interview because I was from Princeton and he was from Rutgers. At least from that comparison. So, so the th name does get you somewhere. I think that's a fair so. point. How about the next segue into the next question is, how about where you go to medical school? Because I'll tell you a funny story. When I was, before I changed into internal medicine, I actually did ophthalmology, right? I remember interviewing for these ophthalmology positions in like Manhattan at Columbia, Cornell. And I was in the waiting room with these other medical students and everyone was like, oh, I went to Harvard, Columbia, Cornell. And I was like, I went to Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And they were like, where's that? And it was in New Jersey, like 70 miles south of Manhattan. So same question for med school. Do you think it matters where you go for med school versus getting into medical school is so competitive nowadays that as you alluded to, a lot of people struggle just to get in. Do you think it matters where if someone has multiple offers, should they consider going into more debt to go to a more widely recognized medical school? Do you think it matters? Nope. Go to the cheapest one. Let me qualify. Cheapest sort of MD school because really it once you get into a medical school like an american medical school with the md degree it, it really doesn't matter i know at nyu neurology wasn't very competitive but i got into one of the better neurology programs and we we're just from robert wood it didn't really matter the name at that point undergrad yes but once you become like once you get into medical school it really doesn't doesn't matter the name even from our class, like your freaking wife, a freaking genius, right? She's dermatology, like the most, one of the most competitive, right? And you were only from state school, right? But yeah, it doesn't really matter. Once you're in medical school, they're just going to really look at if you've done any research in the field, if that's a big thing. Uh, if somebody within the program or if you've done an away rotation at that residency program, so I think you're absolutely right for qualifying what you were saying. I think a lot of the U.S.-based osteopathic medical schools now, the past few decades, have really gained recognition as well. I think when we were in medical school 2003, to be honest, and this sounds ignorant, but I didn't really know what a DO was. But now that I live in South mm -hmm. Jersey, I'm near an osteopathic medical school, Rowan. Um, th there's a lot of them, and they're in all of the fields you could imagine there from everything from primary mm -hmm. care to neurosurgery. So, but yeah. yeah, to your point, people that go to Caribbean medical schools um, may struggle to match into residency because of, uh, a bunch of those mm -hmm. medical schools don't have really good established teaching hospitals. They may struggle to get clinical rotations and letters of rec recommendation and things like that. But DO or MD on medical on U.S. soil. Mm -hmm. It seems like a pretty safe bet to get into m most residencies. There are exceptions. And to be strategic about it, I think if you have a residency training program within your orbit where you go to medical school in the field you want to match into, that helps because you can mm -hmm. get mentorship, you can do research, things like that. All right, Ricky, we've gone over time, but I wanted to give you the opportunity. Are there uh, any other off-the-cuff pieces of advice or none of this is professional legal or accounting or otherwise financial advice, but just as mentorship <laughs> to other physicians coming after you uh, that are younger than us both, what well, you've already covered, very important topic about whole life insurance largely being mm -hmm. a scam for most people. Is there anything else from your own life or from your colleagues or friends that you've seen that you'd like to throw in there? Oh my God. Yeah. Number one, just get started. For me, it was reading the White Coat Investor book. 
If you're a medical student, read the White Coat Investor book for medical students. If you're not a medical student, you could still actually read that, but then also the original White Coat Investor book, whatever age, just get started. I highly recommend it. And even here at Anwise, our, our mission is really almost like the White Coat Investor, but to do it differently and, and hit more people and use a little more technology bend. But just get started. And you can't just rely on your MD salary and think you don't need to know anything about money. So definitely start. Do not be ignorant. And if you are not financially literate or don't have a financial plan, you're going to be a crappy doctor like I was and lose thousands of dollars. And you're going to have to work harder. You're to compromise the care you give to patients. And then also you're going to compromise how much personal time you have uh, with your family. I think you're too hard on yourself. You're a good doctor. You just made some financial mistakes. That's it. <laughs> oh, I would have been better if I didn't, if I wasn't rushing through patients to pay $28,000 of whole life premiums and wasn't in $31,000 of credit card debt. Cause I thought, oh, if I'm a doctor, I don't have to worry about money, right? I'll let Northwestern Mutual handle it. Yeah. And totally wrong. I, I feel so horrible for those patients I rushed through. I did not know being financially stupid would lead me to be a stupid doctor and compromise the care I give the patients. Thank you for all of the wisdom, Ricky. As always, like I mentioned at the start of the talk, it's just so refreshing that people like yourself can be honest with others to mentor them that are coming behind them, stop them from making the same mistakes they did. And any anything else to add? Otherwise, we'll let you go. Thank you so much. Nothing else, man. And God bless you, man. You're doing a great job with a uh, great interview, man. And for uh, and all you do at Anwise, man, and I'm... to do all this to help out other docs, uh, it's impressive with, with Anwise. And that, that's your time away from your family and, and the patients you treat too, man, uh, in order to help other docs, man. So. Yeah, I appreciate it. We'll definitely do a round two because our all of our um, you know medical student mentees and financial fellowship participants, everyone loves you. So appreciate it, man. Take care. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Later.